Welcome to the Musicians Talk Show, episode 31. I am one of your co-hosts, Dallas Dwight. Hey, 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 it's Matt. What's going on, guys? Matt, the other co-host. Today's podcast, as always, is brought to you by the fabulous Banzoogle. Banzoogle is a website builder that makes it super easy to build stunning websites for your music or career in minutes. Choose from hundreds of their mobile-friendly themes and customize your design and content in just a few clicks. Guys, it's so easy. You don't need to know coding or anything. They have tons of great features, uh, the best of which I think is all the tools you need to sell your music and merch commission-free. Yes, commission-free. Most services are going to charge you 1%, 2%, 3%, whatever. They don't take anything. Um, mailing list tools to grow your fan list. We all know how important that is. Integrations to pull in content from all your online services. Uh, that's your Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. And uh, really, really good live support from their musician-friendly team seven days a week. Everyone that works at Banzoogle is a musician or married to a musician or related to the industry in some way. So they know what you're going through. They can help you get there. Uh, here's the best part. Banzoogle plans start at just eight twenty nine dollars a month. I mean, who can't afford that? And includes your own free custom domain name. So everything's right there in one place for you. Go to Banzoogle.com to try it free for 30 days. Be sure to use our promo code TMTS to get 15% off your first year of subscription. That is TMTS. Stumbling over my words here. Banzoogle, websites built for musicians by musicians. Matt, who do we have today? It's funny that you would introduce this one. <laughs> we got Kenny Aronoff today. I was not yeah. there for the interview. Yeah, Kenny Aronoff. Matt uh, couldn't make it for the interview, so I had to do it solo. Um, not that I had to do it at all, really. Kenny just, he's a, he's a, um, What's the best way to say it? He's a force of nature. He's a fluid talker. He just, uh, he, we said hello and he just went off with some of the most valuable music that. industry talk I've ever heard. And I was just, I just stopped. I just sat back and I was like, this is amazing. That's great. And I just, uh, I had such a blast doing this interview and I'm sorry you had to miss it, Matt. Hey, it's all right. I'll listen to it afterward. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> we talk about all kinds of great things like, uh, you know, industry stuff. He was in the movie Hired Gun on Netflix. We talk about that. Uh, studio tips, tour tips, practice routines. He gives you, I don't know if he's done this anywhere else. I'm sure he has. He gives you the exact practice routine he does down to the sticking of like his warm ups and stuff. And it's cool. it's awesome. So um, if you're a drummer, you're really going to dig that. Uh, let's get into it. Hey, Kenny, what's going on, brother? All right, man. I'm all right. I'm here. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. What are you doing out here on the East Coast? Well, it's my mom's 92nd birthday on Saturday, and I'm Ooh. such a workaholic. I literally have not seen her all year. I miss I miss Christmas. I miss, you know, all the holidays. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, that's that's not really good. So I, I, I just blocked out, you know, time to come see her. And my twin brother will be coming out tomorrow, and my sister will be coming tomorrow night. And uh, so we'll all be celebrating her birthday on Saturday. That is awesome. Go, Congrats uh, to her for making oh, it to no. 92. <coughs> Excuse me, for everyone listening, I have a, a rare moment where I actually have a cold or a cough or something, but I, I, I plowed right through it. So, you know, uh, you're going to hear me cough every so often. But anyway, um, the yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing thing, you know. That touches on something that I speak about when I do, uh, you know, my corporate speaking, my teamwork, leadership, innovation speech. And there's a story I talk about in that uh, in that speech. It's actually in my autobiography. It's my uncle Matt. Her brother was uh, a, a real life badass superhero. I mean, this, he was a mofo. This guy was tough. Uh, you know, he was a Golden Gloves boxer, a fighter pilot in the Navy. Uh, he was a, a self-made millionaire, millionaire, had boats and planes. And the guy could do these one-handed push-ups. And um, he always tried to impress us. And one Thanksgiving, he's at our house, my mom's brother, you know, family's together. He's in my room. He's doing these one-handed push-ups, smoking a cigar and laughing at me as I walk in, trying to impress him. And he goes, hey, kid, as he's doing it, you know what the most important thing in life is? And I'm like, Jesus, I don't know. Fuck, I look at his gold watch, and now he's in front of me. This type of guy, if you hit him, you break your knuckles. And uh, and um, he said, no, stupid, it's not money. I said, so I thought he, you know, he was rich. He slams me in the shoulder, almost knocking me over. He said, no, time is the most important thing, man. But at 12 years old, you don't you don't get that, you know. But Absolutely. Like, but by the time I was 18, man, you know, and this is all looking back at my life. Yeah, but yeah. By the time I was 18, because I, when I wrote my autobiography, see, I don't have a rear rear mirror. 
There's no rear view mirror in Kenny Aronoff. It's all only looking forward. What I've done is what I've done. But when I wrote my autobiography, I had to pull the rear view mirror out and go back and look at everything I'd done. It was a mammoth undertaking and intuitively, that's why I said I didn't want to do it because, I mean, just to give you an idea, when I, I had to come up with some sort of stats on how many records I'd played on and gold and platinum. I mean, it came out to as much as I can figure without downloading at all is 300 million records sold. <laughs> I mean, I'm on three, but see, I'm on three records that sold over 40 million each. Two Celine Dion yeah. records and a meatloaf record, and then Ricky Martin, 20 mil, and Bon Jovi. And I mean, just it's pretty easy to add it up fast. And then, you know, Mellencamp, of course. But then, you know, 1,300 gold, platinum, diamond records. Now, a diamond record, for those who, are, who don't know what that is, that's when you sell 10 million. That's you insane. know, it, it's, it's 1 million for a a gold, uh, no, 500 in the USA, it's 500 for gold, right? Uh, platinum, a million platinum, for platinum, yeah. Million, yep. and then, but and then 60 nominated or one Grammy songs, I, that was the hardest. I have no idea, I could be on a lot more, but um, and you know, back then when you were number one, it wasn't like some of these charts where you got like you know, 3,000 people listening, <laughs> it was like there was two charts the hits or the albums, and if you were number one. There was no fucking joke, man. You were number one. You were on every radio station. Absolutely. Every show. So when I say number one, the top 100, <laughs> that's not on hillbilly whatever charts. This is like the big, This you're competing with Michael Jackson and mm -hmm. Bon Jovi or whoever, you know, the greatest thing is at that time. But anyway, so uh, back to my mom. I told my mom, you know, I honor her uh, brother, Uncle Nat, in my speeches. And uh, she says, let me tell you something about time. She says, Kenny, I'm dying. I've got, I've got a heart disease. I've got asthma. I'm falling apart. But, man, I just want to live so much. I've got courses I'm taking at college. i got novels I want to read. I want to see the Boston Symphony Orchestra in the summer next summer and the ballet. And, I mean, it's just I want to watch you and your brother and your, your sister. You know, she's loving where my career is going in all kinds of directions now. She, she wants to live so that she can, she loves life. And yeah. here's a woman, she almost died this year because, you know, she got, uh, you know, the pneumonia. I mean, 20 year olds died from pneumonia. She got pneumonia and has asthma and a heart disease. And she survived it. Man, that's a tough lady. <laughs> It's great, man. She says to me, "Well, I got it from you." I said, "I don't, I don't think so." Yeah, I I got it from you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. I love the idea that that time is the only non-renewable resource we have. We can always get more money. We can always get more of this right. and that. We can never get more time. Once you spend it, it's gone. So you have to actively yeah. and consciously decide how you're going to spend that time. Absolutely. You know. You know, when I look back at my book, I was telling you, when I was 18 years old, graduated high school, you know, most people, it's a big deal to get through high school. You party your ass off, then you go to college if you if you do that. Well, I didn't. I started practicing eight hours a day, seven days a week because I was scared shitless because there was no school of rock back then. Yeah. So I was going to, I, I was just good enough to get into in uh, University of Massachusetts, which was, a you know, so for those who don't know, that, that means you're studying you know, the primary per uh, percussion is timpani, which is all about tuning and technique. And then there's marimba, and then there's, uh, you know, is a whole different thing. And you're reading violin music and flute music to understand, you know, you're doing scales and, and arpeggios and all this technique to be a, a great musician. Then you do snare drum, then multiple percussion. But then you also do three years of music history, music uh, theory, and music um literature and then you're taking all your regular courses that any other kid takes yeah like you know english math history sciences and in one year i switched to, it it's a long story i got in eventually i was i was practicing eight hours a day seven days a week because i knew i sucked i knew i wasn't as good as the kids that were practicing when they were eight years old on those instruments i was playing in a rock band when i was 11 i saw the beatles on tv so i, I couldn't get in the beatles my mom wouldn't call them up, so I uh, started my own band. And I played Beatles music, and we just you know, self-taught. And then you kind of get a little bit of lessons from the band teacher. And 
in high in uh, grade school, but I didn't want to be part of band. I was in rock bands. Why would I want to play with squeaky clarinets when I was playing, you know, Zeppelin and the, and all this cool stuff in in bars or wherever we played high school dances, and um, so this ties into so I was afraid to fail. And failure to me is like dying. And I came up with a line that's going to be it might be the opening line of my new book that I'm should be editing right now. It's called, are you living your life loud? Are you dying on the vine? Because most people are dying on the vine. If you do nothing, you will get nothing. This, you know, I wasn't born successful. All these stats I just mentioned, you know, about me, I want to be clear, man. I got my ass kicked. I mean, I went through whiplash a whole bunch of times. And <laughs> yeah. all the best advice I can tell people with your time is to just never give up. If you give up, then I come by and take what you're waiting for. If somebody, if the shit's there for me to grab, I'm going to take it. Not maliciously. I'm just going after something. Right. You, you, you have to be determined. You have to be determined to go after what you want. And there is no excuses. Forget the excuses. We got tons of them. And this now I'm getting into the heavy shit. I mean, look at fear, being overwhelmed, insecure, uh, Shyness, uh, uh, losing, failure, in, you know, insecurity, all those things, man, that's like breathing air, man. That's just normal shit. That's what we all have to go to. You don't think I wake up at five in the morning going, like, oh, my God, what am I doing? Caffeine is down. Serotonin, dopamine levels are down. And you're feeling like, holy shit, I've done too much. Now what I do is I say, I calm myself down. I go, Kenny, I do 10 shots. No, I'm joking. I mean, I, <laughs> Good I, way to wake up. <laughs> I, I go, Kenny. You have done been in this position before where you feel overwhelmed for whatever reason. And you have you have persevered and come through. It takes longer to per, to, to, to overcome certain challenges, but you always do if you keep going. So just relax. You may not get what you want tomorrow, but you will get it. Now when there's a timeline, I focus like a pit bull. One <clears throat> one thing at a time. Like, dude, in the last three weeks, I spoke for Marathon Petroleum in Ohio. Then I spoke at, uh, then I went the next day and played with Jerry Lee Lewis. T totally different thing in, yeah. in Florida. Then I come home and I play with Fogarty. Then I do a session with, no, I came home and went into the studio with Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys with, you know, badass, best musicians in LA. Then I did a Fogarty thing. Then I went and spoke at Cy Week up in Iowa with 20 other speakers. So, you know, and I'm, I'm revamping my speeches, trying to memorize it. And then I had to go, I'd said I would do a clinic what, uh, up, at, uh, up at Fresno. So that's a three and a half hour drive. I had somebody drive me. I worked the entire way because I was getting ready for South by Southwest because in my speaking, I usually play drums. This was uh, an event where I couldn't play drums. So I created videos and Music like the like when I would use, like demonstrate you know uh, serving the song I would play four number one big hit singles like shake your uh, like uh, see uh, uh, what's the first one oh that thing you do the Tom Hanks movie that's mm -hmm. I played that open thing uh, uh, I'll do anything for love but I won't do that by Meatloaf uh, uh, Belinda Carlisle's Heaven on Earth uh, Blaze of Glory Bon Jovi Shake Your Bomb Bomb by Ricky Martin, there's one other one in there, but uh, Avril Lavigne song, My Happy Ending. And the thing is, is that instead of playing, I had to make, create videos where it's, to make it interesting. My point right. is, is never stopping while I'm doing all this stuff. And uh, meanwhile, I've been, I was prepping after South by Southwest, I had to fly to Milwaukee and I was the musical director for this humongous uh, charity for the kids that are victims. Uh, you know, the parents were, uh, either died or, or got injured in the armed services. And this was a, you know, I had, I had two bands I, I played with and, you know, probably about six different artists. I had to do, deal with that for four months. And as you get closer to it, it amps up and I got, I, everything goes through me. Who's wearing in ears? Who's doing wedges? What's the lot? What's the channel input, uh, uh, list for this band and that band and that artist? Um, what, what about gear? I had to, uh, I had to okay, every gear contracts, all this shit was going on. I mean, I had a team, but if you're the musical director, it all goes through you. Right. And that, that's time consuming. Once again, time. So I'm, I, I am very focused on one thing at a time, reply immediately to an email or I'll lose it, you know, if I can. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, 
that's just uh, being me, you know? Yeah, I love it. That's an inspiring schedule. I wanted to ask you, um, I know you happen to be an extremely well-rounded musician. Um, I don't know that necessarily most drummers, especially those starting out, can say the same. So what would you say to them about the importance of being a well-rounded musician and how they could go about achieving that since drums aren't necessarily a, a, a melodic instrument? So how can they get better at kind of speaking the language that everyone else is? Well, the biggest factor here, once again, is time. You cannot be great overnight, but you can be great over many nights. You know what I'm saying? So what makes me, if people are wondering why Kenny gets hired all the time, and he's on TV all the time and on all these records, um, <coughs> I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to cough, but I had to. Um, it, it's, it's a lot of factors. It's not just how good you play drums, first of all. But a big factor that affected me, I went about, went kind of, I start with self-taught. So basically I was playing from emotion and passion and all the human qualities that are lacking in, let's say, a computer or a cell phone, human touch, bands playing with each other, laughing at each other, doing things together as teams, groups, you know, tribes, that type of thing. I, I experienced it. So I was always kind of, that's the most important thing that any human can do in any career is be as authentic and as real as they can possibly be. Okay. So that's, at least I tapped into that. Then I started, when I went to college, I, I started, I, I was under the gun and way behind, but I had to learn how to read and, uh, uh, you know, uh, read and write music. And that took long, 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 long time. As a matter of fact, that's a big reason why I can handle and multitask so many um, things because I have folders. I got the Jerry Lee Lewis folder, the Fogarty folder, the Bodine's folder. I got the Supersonic Blues Machine folder. I'm working on the charts for this. I can write, I write when I do sessions, I write the charts out the night before I come in there, play through it once, and then it's three takes and I'm done. And it's complete. And I pride myself on doing complete takes with no punching in so that I have that authentic right. thing. But my point is, Getting gigs like the Kennedy Center Honors or doing the Greg Allman tribute where you're playing with 20 artists or the Merle Haggard tribute where you're playing with 20 artists, um, <clears throat> Johnny Cash tribute, the, um, I mean, on and on, these big huge or the Kennedy Center Honors. If you can't read, you will not be there because they're changing shit left and right. And you, with the Kennedy Center Honors, I'd like charts like you only hear the songs. You don't even know what the songs are until five days before. You don't want to mess up playing who who songs in front of the who or playing mess up Zeppelin songs in front of Zeppelin, not to mention the president and all the dignitaries. You do not want to fuck up or you will not come back. I mean, it's serious business. People ask me if I get, if I get nervous. Hell no. I don't get nervous. I get goddamn serious. Mm -hmm. It's not a joke to me. This is serious shit. I mean, act like I'm relaxed and I am, but I'm t very aware that something will probably go wrong and you have to be able to adjust on the dime with 16 cameras on you and they're fil recording it. You do not want to be the guy, especially a drummer, mess it up. So the reading thing was huge component with making me able to do so many different things and being well-rounded. And uh, 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 there's a story where I had to learn, like here's an example, in the heyday of sessions where I was doing, oh, I could be booked, you know, 90 days straight. Three drum sets in L.A., two or three in Nashville. I'd be flying all over the place. Jeez. And I was there was a lot of but there was a lot of money back then. So I just fly. I mean, I went. I did Blaze of Glory with with uh, John Bajori. Went right into two days in another studio in L.A. Two days with Elton John. Went right into four days with Bob Seger. Then I flew to Athens, Georgia. Did the Indigo Girls. Flew back. Did Bob Seger for two more days and did Willie Nelson. This is nonstop. That's the way it used to be. So the point is, um, be able to read and write. Well, then Mel Melissa Etheridge wanted me to suddenly join her tour. And at the end of this three and a half year long tour, so I got the board tapes. I could only rehearse for three hours, nine hours, because I was booked. Nine hours. So we go on tour, and I've got three hours worth of stuff written out that the other drummer did. The point is, I was able to keep her in business. Keep the show on the road. She didn't have to cancel any dates. 
We kept going. She turned around one night to me. It takes me about two and a half weeks, three weeks to get it finally all memorized. Turns around to me and says, you know, I can tell when you're reading and when you're not. And that slapped me in the face. And I went, that's not cool. So then I took it to the next level. When you read, make sure it sounds like you're not reading. Make uh, sure it so- sounds like. Advice. Yeah, make sure it sounds like you're flowing, like you're that kid that I was telling about. Which is, you just you're not really thinking too much. You're just flowing, you're just going with it. You're just being authentic and and natural. So I live in both worlds. But that's with the reading. Okay, now when I was. A kid, I was just happy to be playing any style of music because it felt good. Playing jazz felt good. Playing R&B felt good. Playing rock felt good. Playing country felt good. Playing anything felt good. I was just playing drums. I loved music. And I was raised in a family where we had a lot of jazz, a lot of classical, a lot of R&B, a lot of everything. And my parents were open. <clears throat> when I went to music school, of course, I played rock and roll, but it was funny. The classical people didn't dig it that I was playing jazz, but they definitely didn't dig me playing rock. The jazzers thought, what are you doing that classical shit for? Why don't you just be a jazz musician? And they all kind of like, what's that rock crap? And I didn't care when anybody hired me. I was enthusiastic, great attitude, served the song, served the artist, served the band, served who's ever hiring me. And people wanted to get Kenny Aronoff all the time. Now, was I the fastest drummer? Hell no. Was I the most talented? Hell no. Was I the, the most this, the most that? Hell no. Everybody's got something special about them. I, I'm the type of guy who say, have you heard any drummers lately that are, that are aggressive? Pretty much everybody who plays, I dig unless they're like completely out of time. Because they do something that I wouldn't do, I wouldn't have thought of. Because every individual on the planet is, uh, looks different, has a different personality. That's your your biggest selling point in this life we live is that you are you and you know there's nobody like you so i was always open to playing lots of different styles of music and i would refuse to and whenever i did i tried to do it as authentic as i could well you know 50 years of that and you suddenly like i did suddenly you're good at a lot of things for example okay so we're doing a uh, brian wilson record one of the songs was reggae well, I've played reggae. I'm not an expert, but I'm damn good at it. And not only was I playing reggae, but the guitar player, Wadi Wattel, who's, you know, musical director of Stevie Nicks and has played with the Stones and all kinds of cool people. Wadi's going Warren Zevon and the section for a while, I think. Um, he says, okay, do, 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 do more of a shuffle thing in your high So I'm going to go one, two, and that, two, and that. And see, I was doing that. I was going, that, 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 that. Got the, right. Got, I was doing all this bit fancy stuff on the hi hat. Yeah. When he, he said he was right, it's getting in the way of his. He let him be the one doing all the rhythmic shit. I just go. I make the groove. Right. My snare drum, of course, nothing's on beat one. It's all on beat three. One, beat four. Yeah. Bam, on three. And, okay, because I played reggae and I love it, I was able to deliver on a mm-hmm. session. It wasn't like if you get Kenny, you just get one thing, rock and roll. I mean, I've, I've done orchestral arrangements where I hear songs. But pretty, I just bring all kinds of weird percussion and build it from there, you know, because of my orchestral thing. Anyway, you know, I mean, I record with the Buddy Rich Big Band. I'm not going to say I'm... It, you know, a great jazz drummer like Dave Weckl or, you know, Steve Smith or my buddy uh, Peter Erskine or, or, you know, Jeff Hamilton, you know. But I'm, I've am i played a lot of jazz as a kid, so I under, I relate to the whole thing of swing. You know, it's like I, 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 I played in jazz bands and ever since I was like uh, 16. I used to play in right. trios at college and the big bands, you know. So anyway. You asked one question, I just gave you 30 minutes. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. I mean, I have to ask this next one. With all of the ridiculous studio experience under your belt, what are some tips you would give to, to drummers specifically about getting it done in the studio? Uh, here's the first thing. I always get the song ahead of time. And I, I'm the most anal chart writer you'll ever meet. I write every single note out. 
every single note, I can do it in 30 minutes. I write every note that is on the, the, the program, the, the drum sequence or whatever, you know. I always ask when I'm going to do a session, because see, it used to be you didn't have to do that. You created in the studio, but that costs time and money. Nowadays, because the budget's smaller, <clears throat> I'll get the demos, I'll write everything out, and I do the, the what I call the obvious. You play what they are used to hearing with your feel. Then the next take, what I'll do, or, or when we're rehearsing, I'll try to do the same thing, but I'll start adding some, some more creative things that I feel are more of my style. Then the third thing, I might go a little bit further out. Then I start thinking out of the box. Most of the time, people fall in love with what the program is. And so you, you can't go as crazy as you used to be. With like when I was with Mellencamp, he wanted me to come up with something that nobody ever played before. You know, that's rare these days. But know the song, write the chart up before you get in there and practice the grooves. So when you walk in there, you're sharp. If the drummer ain't happening, nothing's happening. It's, it's, when, even at this point in my career, man, I just did three songs yesterday in an hour and a half for this guy from China. Mm -hmm. I have a studio, I have an engineer, have a very expensive gear, make sure we got the sounds right. You know, I play through one song once and make sure everything's working right. And then I go after it. And I give the guy three takes on every song. First one is like spot on. Every, and like I said, I don't like to punch because I want it to feel like <clears throat> when I'm playing from beginning to end, it creates an attitude of like, holy shit, you better get this right. And you can hear me. You can hear my personality, that edge, that feel, that energy. If you think that, ah, oh, I'll just let them fix it, that's a whole different attitude. That's a whole different feel, don't you think? Absolutely. And, you know, um, so what people should do is become familiar with the music before they go in. If they don't know how to write a chart, then you better spend more time working on it. But be prepared and think ahead of time. Bring the, uh, options, different snare drums for options. Speak to the producer. Ask the producer, what are you, this song, it sounds like Elton John, or it sounds like Foo Fighters, or it sounds like <clears throat> Royal Blood. I mean, what? talk to the producer. Let the producer say, you know what, no, no, no. No, I know it sounds like that, but I want it to be more like the police. And then you go, okay, does he really mean that? Well, then you bring a variety of snare drums and, and, and ideas to the, to the session. Or if you don't, then be ready to be on the spot and be the guy that's kind of might be slowing things down. You know, that's how you prepare. Make sure your equipment's tuned before you even get there. You know, I, my, my studio is all set up all the time. Or if I do a big session, I have crews that do it. Make sure. And I get there early before everybody, because we're going to get a drum sound, you know, drum check. Well, I make sure I'm there early enough because I want to make sure my drum sounds great. You know, really great. I'll tune everything the way I think it should be or tweak it. All these specific things. And then attitude, man. You better get along with people, man. Otherwise, you know, why would I hire an asshole when I can hire a nice guy? Sure. It's that simple. It's that simple, man. You better – oh, my God. We're, we Listen, with all my stats, I still serve. If you hire me, I serve you. You're the boss. Of course you're going to ask me my opinion. But I'm very clear about the fact that you have a song has a specific groove and beat. My job is to make that beat feel better with me playing it than any program or any other drummer and add some of my other stuff to motivate the other musicians to make this song amazing. Now, I'll ask a musician in the studio, let's just say specifically drummers, what's the purpose of a drummer? And everybody says very, very obvious things which are true. Time, beat, attitude, feels, and everything. Those are blades of grass. Let's look at the whole lawn. Let's look at all the blades of grass. The purpose of a drummer on a recording studio, especially back in the day when, you know, we were making records for the radio, is to get the goddamn song to be on the radio and be number one. That's your goal, period. It's not about you. It's about the song. And when the song goes to number one, you've done your job. And when it goes to number one, the artist or the band and the record label make millions and millions of dollars back in the day when the charts really meant something. And you did your job and you get called to do the next song. That's why I have a lot of big hits. They go, who did that? Oh, shit. Let's get that guy. And he came up with those parts. Right. Serve the song. Our job is to 
to make the song as great as it can be. Yeah. So what about um, the, the flip side of the studio? What about tour tips? What are some tour tips you have for everyone? Well, touring, one of the biggest things is besides being consistent and doing your job, I'm not one of those guys that drinks or does anything before a gig. Maybe in 1980 when we opened up, Mellencamp opened for Heart, we were playing 45 minutes. we do a shot before we go on, but mm-hmm. whoa, those days were way gone. I drink, I'll drink wine afterwards or something, or not at all, but the point is, man, when I get up there, I'm, I'm, I want to be the most solid guy. And it's a challenge because... Once again, drummers are we 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 listen, we learn, we lead because we're drummers, but we're not the boss. You, our job is to make the boss be the boss. So, for example, if you're playing with clicks, which is easy for me, Mel Camp tours we play with clicks. Bruce, uh, Bob Seger did clicks. Um, you know, just get the song started in the groove and shut it off. Then uh, Smashing Pumpkins, same thing. <clears throat> because to me, the right tempo, the interesting thing is with Fogarty, he doesn't use any clicks. I, I use him on a few songs just to ca- count off to him. Mm-hmm. But he counts off, and man, more times than not, like 98% of the time, he likes things very on the edge, very fast, really fast. So anybody yeah. hears me playing fast, it's not me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I even put that in my book. I put the worst review I've ever gotten. In the L.A. Times. And people came up to me after the, God, what the, what? I said, the guy doesn't get it. He thought I should sound like Doug Clifford from Creedence Clearwater. John told me, and I said it right in my book, when I got in the band, when I told him, do not sound like Doug Clifford. Mm -hmm. Do not sound like Doug Clifford. And do not do those fills or play on top of the beat. I want your snare on the edge. I want you to drive me hard. Oh man, he'll turn around and say, "Come on, come on, come on!" And we were playing really fast. Yeah, and, you know, <laughs> like, an, like was, a Journey live was, record or something. <laughs> fast, man. I prefer not to do that. I like the original tempos of everything. Right. But, but John likes to. John's a badass. But the bottom line, he's the boss. He's the boss. I have to follow him. Now I'm leading because I'm the drummer. I try to keep it in the pocket. Well, John, you play. I get my hi hat. Very accurate with his guitar. But his guitar's got this swingy thing, so it's a little tricky sometimes. Same with when I play with Jerry Lee Lewis. It's a very unique thing. So you try to put it right where it sounds great. As if I was the producer and I'm listening. Then I put my kick drum right on the hi-hat. And with John and Jerry Lee, I put the snare drum right on or a little on the edge to create that forward motion. But don't speed up (laughs) if you can help it. <clears throat> just this this tension. It's a very tricky thing. Uh, but anyway, so and, and being on the boat, do your job. And the hardest thing sometimes for some people is to be able to get along with all the multiple personalities. You're all stuck on a van together in a bus. Everyone's going through shit. Everybody's got all kinds of mood changes, life situations. You have to be able to, you know, deal with that shit. You just have to. I mean, it's like... Uh, I mean, we all, everybody gets pissed off and frustrated and God damn it and this and that, but that's part of it. You want to keep, you want to just be somebody they want around, you know, when you're not on stage. That's what, that's what John Mellencamp said a long time ago. He says, man, I, I don't even like people, he said. He said, I, I want people, you know, that I get along with, though. I want people I want to hang with, you know, especially when we're not playing music, which is about 22 hours of the day. Or with sound check, you know, twenty hours a day. So, and Sammy Hagar said the same thing. So I got a lot of drummers that could do this this chicken foot tour. You know, it's so many people calling me up. But he he said that uh, um, Chad Smith said Kenny's your guy, and it wasn't just my playing; it was personality, how to how to fit in. You know, right? Yeah, you the know? pro at the pro level, everyone's a good player. You got to look for those other things. Absolutely. You got to be able to fit in and get along and leave your crap at home. Absolutely. Just, just being a total pro. I mean, that's all it is. Yeah. That's, that's one of the biggest tips. And I, I tell people when they're, you know, like on tour or something, 
and they're it's not they're not it's not their band, you know, they're not a, 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 which is usually the case for a drummer. I say you got two choices. Two choices in this situation. Stay or leave. <laughs> Most situations there's no negotiating. Right. I can't go up to an artist who hires me in most cases, you can't go up and say, hey, that's not fair. I should have the same room as you or whatever. I don't know, whatever it is. You work it for them. They may I have a story. Okay. Guy goes, I won't say the name of the band, huge artist, can sell up like mad arenas. Bass player, played only about 10 years. They're best buddies. <clears throat> Songwriter, singer, you know, they drink after the show, they hang out. Bass player is great. And he goes up to him one day and says, hey, dude, um, I got this opportunity to be the musical director for a TV show. And the guy, the artist went, oh, that's awesome. He says, yeah, you know, the only problem is it's on a night of a show that we're doing at Madison Square Garden, New York City. Um, and he said, but I got a guy, a bass player, who's badass, he's going to learn everything perfectly. Well, guess what? That bass player that gave up his job for the sub, that sub is still playing with him 10 years later, and that guy got dumped because the artist was like, fuck you. You're not going to be there on my show at Madison Square Garden? And and the bass player told me, I can't believe he did this. I said, I said, dude, I slapped him in the head. He says, you idiot. You guys aren't best, best friends like he, you think he is. He likes you because you play great bass and you're fun to hang out with afterwards and you make a lot of money for him. That's it. Yeah. He's not. Has he been inviting you over to his house to spend Christmas? I mean, you guys, you're, you're working friends. But when you start insulting him like that which this bass player didn't he's the nicest guy in the world he was a little bit naive to the fact that that was going to insult him you know i mean right. i i've gotten into that myself you know where this is the tricky part where an artist wants you to be on call like Mellencamp did for years wants you to be on call uh well, john had us on a small retainer i took myself off the retainer because i was making so much money in the studio i wanted to be able to call my shots and technically, that's right, but I get where John was at. He wanted a band with that they were available when he called. Do whatever you want, but when when I call, you have to come. Well, I didn't like that because I'm saying, look, you call, and I'm in the studio playing with, you know, uh, you know whoever, what, what was it? It was, um, oh, uh, I'll space them out. Great, killer band. The, um, oh. Ah, uh, whatever. It was a killer band. So I said, no, I can't make it home. And, you know, that created a lot of tension. And I get it. And I, I, I got, I've gone through that a couple of times. Well, they want to own you, but you're only working three to four months a year scattered all over the place. And I've, right. I've tried to say, look, uh, I, I, I cannot afford to pay my bills by what we do. So I have to book other stuff. And most of the time, I can switch stuff. But there was a couple of times I couldn't. And I said, look, if you put me on retainer, said, we don't do that. I went, exactly. You don't do that. So I have to book work. And some things I can't get out of, like with contracts and big speaking engagements where, you know, corporations spent six months putting it together and they decided you're the guy. Oh, my God. I mean, you can bail. I mean, anything is changeable, but, man, you just – be ready to be, you know, people. You can't win in a situation like that. Someone's right. going to be pissed. Someone's going to be pissed. Yeah, so you're just trying to strike that balance between doing what's best for the artist who wants you to be loyal and doing what's best for your own career. Yeah, exactly. And uh, those are some of the quagmires you, know, you get into. Yeah, that's yeah. tough. What about yeah. um, health and fitness? Well, healthy life is a wealthy life. If you're not healthy... You know, which I'm not right now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this last month, I haven't been able to work out nearly like I usually do. And so what I do is I adjust my diet to make sure I'm eating lean. So I keep my, uh, you know, muscular and uh, low uh, fat content down. Um, 
I'm I'm not happy where I'm right now. I just need all I need is a couple of weeks of cardio and and weight training the way I like to do it. And I may even get a a a, a coach to do some uh, boxing and uh, uh, just mix it up. I, I I had a trainer for 14 years, different trainers, and they just come up with new things, techniques, and stuff. And uh, I I think it's important. I have eight steps to being healthy. One, lifting weights, which keeps your hormone levels up. Our hormone levels change real young. It changes fast. Guys' testosterone peaks 17, 18 or something, 19. Then it starts going down. Crazy. And then um, DHEA levels, you know, all these things start changing. Yeah. So when you lift weights, it brings your hormone, it keeps your hormone levels up and young. Well, those hormone levels beat, fight off cancer, diabetes, and, and uh, uh, cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. Uh, so to start with. The second thing I, I, I think is important, besides being muscular, it's good for that. The other thing is cardio. Really important to exercise the most important muscle in the body, which is the heart. It's the only thing you can do. Playing drums is great, but I think cardio, the right type of training on cardio, it brings it to a whole nother level. So I'll do that. I'm going to do that tomorrow, even though I'm cold, sick. I'm going to try to get a killer night's sleep if I can. What happened with me, I'm such a intense mofo when i get sick my body starts to fight and speeds up it gets aggressive <laughs> it starts fighting with my own i'm like dude just relax no 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 <laughs> my body's going those germs are trying to get us we're gonna kick their ass on meanwhile i'm stuck there laying in bed with my body flu feeling and of speedy and oh man it's horrible yeah. anyway. <clears throat> but i'm not i'm not normal so um Okay, the third thing is uh, stretching. So you want strength and flexibility. Uh, stretching, you know, with anything, yoga, anything to create flexibility. So you strengthen the muscles, you stretch. Fourth thing is probably the most important thing, or very, very important, is uh, diet. And it's what you don't eat is more important. Like for me, in the breakfast this morning, I was on the run, so I had to take a flight. So I had, just today I decided to use, co I have coconut milk with no sugar. I have... Uh, get, you know, go to Trader Joe's or Whole Foods or even, you know, rock, you know, regular grocery grocery. Then I have a scoop of vegan protein powder. I fluctuate between vegan and whey protein. Then I had a scoop of super green food um, called Nano Greens, one of the best they make out there. Then I have a scoop, uh, a whole cup of berries, blueberries, because they're antioxidant and antibody builders. Then I have a scoop of peanut butter, which is fat, good fat. When you have sugar and fat, it cuts your appetite down. T take that with the number five thing, which is supplements, and then I, sh I answer that with some uh, co uh, coffee, espresso. You know, and um, man, that is rocking. And then, um, you know, as, as much vegetables as you can get in you. Last night for dinner, me and my wife went out. I had a huge, huge salad with some shrimp on it. Protein and... Um, and, and veggies. And then I snuck a couple of her fries. They're pretty healthy fries just to get some carb. And that's sort of cheating. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's better to stay away from fried food. That's my biggest weakness. Is I, I love to dip into some fries every so often. But, you know, um, let's see. Stay away from sugar as much as possible. Just natural sugar like honey. And if you want to put in your coffee or tea, uh, uh, natural sugar like fruit. And the earlier in the day that you have it, the better you can burn it off. Um, stay away from processed foods, you know, things that are have a lot of fake shit in it. Oh man, it's like we're in such trouble with food these days because the soils are all poisoned. Yeah, it's, it's the soil and the water, and oh my god, we are like just blowing it. So even if you have the the, the super grass fed, you know, beef and fish and chicken and all that shit. It's like you got to consider what, what are they eating and where is it grown? And, you know, it's you know you can't win. But you do the best you can. And vegetables grow in this these dangerous soils. And you know everybody's heard about the Monsanto and all this shit. You know, you know it's you got to do the best you can. And I I rather spend more money to eat right because you either pay now or you pay later. I mean, yeah, my my last year at my. At age 64, my metabolic rate, my metabolic age came up at 19. In other words, my stats on particular tests That's were over awesome. 19. Yeah. My body fat has been as low as 7.8%. 
It's not there right now. I'll guarantee you that. <laughs> um, but you probably double that. Easy. For a guy my age, it should be between 11 and 21%. I've never been over. Always, like the most I think I've ever had was like maybe 13. I'm always under the 11. So before I have my blood test, I'm going to work out for a month. If I'm, if I'm around, you know, I have to do it on the road, but I'm going to get that down there. But, uh, and then, okay, so number five is um, supplements. And I take a, a killer multiple vitamin. I take zinc, which which converts estrogen into testosterone, or at least it blocks your body from making estrogen, which guys, you get older, you don't want that. You want muscle. You want flabby tits. Um, and um, I take, uh, from sick like this, I'll start taking vitamin, more vitamin C. I take, like I said, the super green food. I take, um, my doctor has me take like a DHEA, which is something you start going down on when you get older. Oh, I get blood work every year, so they just see, oh, you need a little bit of DHEA here. Uh, you can get it anywhere. Um, and then I take fish oil. I take about uh, two to 4,000 uh, milligrams of fish oil a day, which is great for so many things on your body, including hair, which obviously... I failed miserably in that department. <laughs> well, I should say, I don't have hair on my head, but I got it on my eyeballs and tongue. You know, <laughs> well, it's <just> joke. <laughs> Goes everywhere I don't want to go. But you no, know, anyway, I'm just joking. Um, supplements are really important, and and I t and I, and I take uh, the multiple I take. My doctor um, created for people like me that are super super workaholics. So we have a lot more B complexes. A lot more things that will keep you healthy and uh, keep you going. Um, then um, that's uh, five. Number six, or no, number six is water. Water is the most important nutrient you can have in your body. Every organ in your body needs water. And you should drink half your body weight in ounces. So if you weigh 200 pounds, you should have 100 ounces of water a day. I don't drink enough, but that's a real important one. You could die in three days without water, but... You could live 40 days without food. Um, and then the next thing is uh, sleep. Seven hours is the magic. Some people say eight. It's where you repair your brain and your body. I suck at sleep. But I, I try to, like tonight, if I wake up after three and a half hours, I'll read a little bit, go back to sleep. I try to add it up to seven to, uh, or uh, the best I can or eight. Right. And then the third thing, the worst thing for you, or one of the worst things for you is stress. And the way you get rid of stress is to meditate. Stress will, you know, when someone says something to you and all of a sudden you feel ill and you feel weak, isn't that amazing how words can do things like that? Well, all of a sudden you're, you're like hit with stress. You've got to meditate, and breathe, and chill down, get out of that because it's not healthy. Absolutely. Yeah. So what does, your, those, what does your meditation look like? You, you know, I don't have any particular program. I mean, I was younger. I did TM. I still remember that mantra, and I was a Buddhist for a while, so I know that mantra. I'll say one of those two, and just, you know, think, uh, you know, just try to slow down, which takes me about a half hour. Now, actually, I do, I use this to 20 minutes. You can, what you can do is go online. They have these great, so much stuff online now. You can just get a 10, 15, 20-minute uh, meditation thing on YouTube where you, somebody talks you through it. It's phenomenal. Right. Yeah, that's a great tip. And I'm, yeah. and I'm, that helps you on the road too, right? All of this stuff. Yeah, well, I, I try to carry it with me all the time. You know, it's a, it's a. At least I think about it every day. That's the point. Is it's in my mind. What am I eating? Like, what did I eat wrong today? Let's see. I had uh, on the plane. I did have a small. <coughs> supposed to be a healthy cookie. They weren't healthy. Ah, so I broke. <laughs> it. That was my big one. Big bad thing. And then they had. Some sort of they had these snacks, and I had some health bars, but you can't just eat health bars. I needed some carbs, so I had a little bit of these little crackers, but they probably had eight billion chemicals in it. That's not good, you know. Right. And, it, and you got anything that's got a million ingredients in it? Oh yeah, yeah. Stay away from it, especially if it's all that, you know, scientific language. You yeah. should say tomato water. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> salt. Tomato water. Salt. You know, not like absolutely. Yep. You know. So, what do you think about 
musicians needing to pick up and move to a bigger city. Do you think that's necessary? Do you think that's not necessary with the internet? Um, what do you What are your thoughts? Well, it depends what you want. What your goal is. If you want to get be seen, really be seen, and really go the full distance, you move to the you know Nashville or L.A. And you do the internet. You do it all. But I always told my students when I was teaching at IU, one of them is Ryan Brown, who's now playing with Zappa. And um, I told these guys, man, move to L.A. or Nashville, you got to give it seven, eight years. And Ryan went, that's bullshit, man. I'm, he told me later in life, I thought, oh, man, I'm going to go there and kill it. And he said, you were right. <laughs> I don't care how good you are. You don't walk into these cities and say, I'm here. They'll go, nice. There's like about 100 people like you just came in this year and 100 the year before, 100 the year before, 100 the year before. So I say going to these cities, if it really is in your, if you really feel like you want to do it, and you, you, and you, I say it's a great opportunity to learn and grow as a human being, even aside from the music thing. The, if you make that move, you're going to benefit no matter what. You're going to learn a lot about yourself. You're going to find out who you truly are. These are all big things that have nothing to do with the music business specifically. But you need to know these things to be a great musician or great at anything you do. So making the move, I say, here's what you do, man. Go out there, get a couple of day gigs, get in a part with three or four guys, try it, get to know the scene, bang around town, get people... Just try, man. You can't look. And then you go, my son, he, he went out there for about two years and decided, man, I hooked up with some auditions. He's a drummer. And he said, I, I'm just not, you know, I'm not you. I don't want to slap my drums around. And, you know, it's also not the end game it used to be. So that makes it a little bit trickier. Right. But I, I, I say to people, it's, it's a wonderful experience to try to make it in a big city. Then you'll have no regrets. It's expensive, but you're going to learn a lot. You cannot lose. You learn a lot to make it be really big and successful. Well, that's a crapshoot these days because this is the system is so wackadoodle. It's like there's no money to develop in a band. Like let's 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 put out four. 1987, Joshua Tree came out, number one record of the year by U2. It was their fifth record. Malakamp's big hit record, American Fool. That was his fifth or sixth record. There was money back then to invest in these bands and right. keep them going. And everything, like back to my thing about time, everything great takes time. Everything. Everything. That's why you have to decide how you want to spend your time because, man, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Yep. <laughs> Lock is ticking, clicking, 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 clicking. So, what do you do to actively stay creative and inspired after all these years? in an industry that is known to just wear you down? Wow, uh, that's a great question. Um, well, I, for me, I've created so many different things and projects. You know, I'm writing a second book. I still do sessions in my studio. I do sessions in the big rooms, you know, ca you know occasionally with the big artists. <clears throat> I go on tour. I still love playing live. Um, um, so I'm inspired every day by just being alive. I've got, you know, um, a speaking business I'm very passionate about because it's fun. I get to play. I get to talk about things I really, really, really believe in. I really do. And I, this is, it's not an act. You know, it's, it's, it's for real. I, I've just learned how to develop my presentation so that it's easier to receive. I got a long ways to go to be super, super great. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm very inspired. That those, so those who do projects, are, I'm, uh, uh, the president of Kodak Film wants to do a documentary on me. Ooh, that's exciting. Uh, I may have a meeting to be a host on a TV show. Ooh, that's exciting. So I, I get excited by all these other projects while I continue to do, to do what I do, you know? Right. So it's kind of like a, a snowball effect <coughs> for you. Well, I'm lucky that I, I like being around people. So I get excited when I'm around people and inspired. And so it's playing music in most cases is a, is a great way to be around other people. Now, it's interesting I say that because my studio uses just my engineer and me, but we talk about all kinds of stuff. It's a, it's still a great hang. I'm still performing for him. 
you know, or yeah, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I just am inspired by everything, you know. Absolutely. So uh, last night I watched Hired Gun for the first time. That was, um, I mean, I I really loved it. I'm fascinated by that side of the industry, and I know that's your that's your yeah. thing. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. What was it like being a part of that project? Um, you know, I just I'm I'm really curious. No different than what we're doing right now, just talking about my life. There you I go. Think they, I think that movie was done very well. It was really incredible. They did leave out the guy. They, they left out a, a component which. Uh, it's going to be uh, the director is wants to get financing to film, and if I do my documentary, I'll I'll talk about it. I want to talk about the guys that lasted four decades, not one band or two bands. Well, that's okay, that's great. You're still a higher gun, but they didn't talk about uh, you know the people that have made you know have lasted to last in this business right for four decades. Virtually impossible. Why? How did that happen? Why didn't they talk? They didn't talk about that. I mean, I think I talked about it, but they didn't use that. To put together a documentary, uh, 90 minutes, is a tricky thing. You know, it's like writing a book. I, my book was 600 pages, got knocked down to 325 because there's a certain length that's cool and you go too long, it's boring. But, um, yeah, anyway, I, I, I was I'm honored that I was part of it. Um, I thought there were some people that should have been in there that weren't, but you know, there was like 65 people that were not in it that got interviewed. They just decided to take a, an approach that would be what you saw. Still amazing. Right. You know, oh yeah, it definitely was. One, really well, one thing that I loved is you, we were talking earlier about your chart writing. Um, one scene in the movie, you get, a quick glimpse at your charts. And of course me being the nerd I am, of course I freeze framed it there. So you mm-hmm. see, um, you know, you're not, and like you said earlier, you're not just writing verse chorus stop. You, you literally, yeah. I mean, there were 16th note triplets. Like yeah. it was yeah. every single note. Yeah. And you do that for every song you, you work on. Yeah. So what are some of your, what would you, I mean, how would you tell someone else to kind of do that? Cause that's such a detailed method. You're going to have, yeah, I don't know. You have to learn how to read and write music and just, duplicate what you see in books. I'm, I'm the guy that likes to put the hi-hat and the symbols on the top space mm-hmm. and not attach, not attach it to anything. A lot of books don't do it that way. I like to put the kick and snare together with stems going down right. and the hi-hat and the ride symbol up top. So I see my eye immediately goes, up top, your hi-hat and ride symbols doing that. Is it accented eight notes or is it even eight notes or open hi I wrote hi-hat and I'll go, medium open or I'll go hi-hat and I'll put the accents and then I'll go hi-hat even or I might go even open even medium open mm-hmm. so I'm very clear about what's going on <clears throat> and then crash them with your diamonds and then if it's a ride I just put the same axes are there leave it on the same space right above that top line and I just say ride you know and it makes it simple now all the lines are tom-toms so right, the top right, right. Line, it's all Tom. So kick is there. Kick is in the, the the bottom space, which would be F in the in the, in the key of, on a uh, on a piano in the key of C. It's, the middle C is below it. So you got F, and then the one octave above middle C on the 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 the, the space, not the top space, but the one below it is the snare drum. So you got do ba do got do do. And my eyes look at the top line with the hi hats doing, and then the kick and snare, and then if there's a tom fill, then my eye goes to that. I mean, I've got it all written out. Right. And any, and when I do these big TV shows, I got the count offs written out. Who to count off? Who to wait to tune their guitars? I got everything. I could look at a song. I couldn't tell you what the fuck is coming next because I just rehearsed with six artists today. Right. And <laughs> the show tonight, I'm like, what? Oh, yeah. what was that? Movie? I don't have time. Yeah, at that level, and, you have to have charts because no human being can keep all that straight with that little time. Yeah, and, and and you know you don't want to mess up a TV show. Absolutely, yeah. When the stakes are high, you got to get it done. Yep. So what yeah. do you, what do your practice routines look like after all these years? I have a, a functional practice routine which I'm going to do tonight before I go to bed. Uh, and it's basically a twenty to thirty minute routine. It's all whenever I'm doing stuff with my hands. It's, it's, it's <coughs> 
I do all my videos that I came up with all based on stick control lines 1 through 13, but I flip lines 11 and 12. Otherwise, when you go into line 13, which is right, 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 left, 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 right, 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 right you'd have seven rights in a row. That would slow your whole thing down. Right. So I flip line in 12 and, and 11 and 12, and um, I go through those things, but I'm playing the rhythmic patterns with my feet, like heel down, just quarter notes like with my heel down. And I go through these patterns. These are eight notes, so it's twice as fast. Like, but the 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 foot's going do 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 heel down. So what I'm doing is I'm exercising that ligament with the heel down, stretching it. See? Then I go when I get done with those thirteen exercises, those those lines. So let me see. I'll go one and two and three and four and two and two and three. Two measures of each. Then I go do the whole thing again, one two thirteen without stopping. Starting now with the left foot now jumps in. Because when you play drums, you switch all over the place and you don't just stop and get started again. Right. You have to flow from one thing. Then the other foot exercise I'll do is I'll do the double bass drum. Right, left, right, left, right. And they're, do, uh, they're doing eighth notes, just what your hands are doing. So going between line one and two is hell. Because you're going right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, with your foot going right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. While you keep your feet going right, left, right, left, all of a sudden you switch to left, right, left, right with your hands. Yeah. Oh, my <laughs> God. Yeah. They don't like that. So and then I go through that. Then I do the whole thing again with my heels up. See, what it is, it's I'm warming my hands up, but I'm warming my feet up. And I'm warming them up with techniques that I use when I play. There's not one wasted note. I don't have time to fuck around. So I work on things that, then I go into this molar technique thing where I use, where I accent. Um, I accent loud, soft, loud, soft. So it's like, an, that's like the hi-hat pattern. One and two and three and four. Loud, soft, loud, soft, loud, soft. That keep, that's eight notes. And I keep my foot heel down, once again, playing chord notes. But, 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 but then, I start accenting every three eight notes. But to 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 meanwhile my foot's still doing this. See what I'm saying? Yeah, it sounds it kick goes, ass. <laughs> you kick ass. So then I go to fours. And I, by the way, I do this with my right hand. One, two, 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 one. Left hand. One, two, one, two, one. Foot still doing corner. Then I go one and two and three and four and one and two. And one, and two, and three, and four. Left hand, one, and two, and three, and four, and one, and two, three, and four, and one, and two, three, and four, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It's all molo technique. The first one is loud, and everything else is softer. Left hand, one, two, three, four, one, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two. Left hand, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two. Now six, one, and two, and three, and one, and two, Left hand, one, and two. And then I do it with all those foot patterns. And then I do them again with my heels up. That's just getting warmed up. Mm -hmm. Now, then I get into single stroke rolls. I go into double bass room stuff. All stuff that I use in a show. All stuff I need. And anything that I need work on, that I need to develop a technique on that I remember. Oh, yeah, if I'm going to do like John Bond. If I, I played Bond, eight Bond, uh, Zeppelin songs and Whiskey and Go-Go on Sunset Strip where I was a featured drummer. Well, I, I practiced a lot of triplet stuff, you know, the, the one years with his foot, like a good times, bad times. I created a whole routine just around that. And then also, I do what John Bonham does. If I'm doing triplets on the toms and the foot, I go left, rack tom, right, four tom, then foot. Right, right, yeah. He had his left hand, that's what I do. I practice those things. I add them to my workout. So I'm practicing shit that I'm going to use today. Because guess what? You're being judged on what you do Today, right now, not on with something you're going to do later. Then if I have time to do other stuff, which I never do, then I'll work on other stuff. But it, the, I will do that routine. Uh, I, I've left a lot out because, you know, I don't want to give it all away, man. You guys, you know. You <laughs> figure something out on your own. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'll do that before sound check. I'll do it before the show. And like tonight, I'll do it before I go to bed. That's awesome. One of the last questions I want to ask you is, um, could you share one of the <coughs> one of the craziest war stories, so to speak, with us? Because I know you've had some crazy ones. Well, there was one time I jumped out of the airplane and I forgot to put the parachute on. Yeah, that was horrible. <laughs> but, I, but I lived. Uh, I'm just joking. 
Yeah, well, that, was, that one's hard to believe. <laughs> I, I had, had so much wine, I jumped off the bed thinking I was in the airplane. No. Uh, God, people ask me this. This, this, um, oh, man, what do I tell them? <clears throat> First of all, it's a blur. Let me think now. Well, I put it in my book, I can say it. Two, um, two girls picked me up. and uh, One was bisexual, one was a lesbian, and they picked me up, and I was in the bar talking to them, and uh, they were real nice. I was on tour with Melissa Etheridge, so that made sense. I toured them and uh, with her, and then they were talking to them. One's really beautiful, and that was that. You know, I said, well, I'll see you guys later. I was, went, got in the elevator, and they jumped in the elevator. I went, oh, that's, oh, that's cool. You're staying here, too? That's cool. And I got off on the 18th floor, let's say, and then they get off, and that's where I went, whoa, this is getting a little bit too coincidental. <laughs> Walking down the hall, they're behind me, and they're kind of giggling and stuff. I get to my room. I say, hey, good night. And they go, well, um, hey, can we um, want to hang out a little bit more? And I'm like, oh, my God. Now, you have to remember, I'm a professional at this stuff. I'm an expert. So I know what's going on. I went, uh, yeah, okay. And, I let, you know, they came in, and and then it was like then some explanation was going on. Well, you know. My girlfriend did you. And it was that kind of thing. And I'm like, I don't know, man, if we should be doing that. Next thing you know, we were doing it. It was over. I'll leave the details out, but it was. And then they left. They left, and I'm sitting there going, what the hell just happened? <laughs> now, that's, that's, is that good enough? Is that a good enough war story? That's a great enough war story. <laughs> you know, and uh, I, go, I can't divulge who those people were. But it was cool, man. I mean, you have to realize, you know, and this was a tricky thing in my book, you know, because I, I had a couple of divorces, and both both women are cool. We were all young, man. I was when I was with Mellencamp, I was twenty seven. We're playing in arenas. I'm twenty seven. The girls, well, then we became big, really big. I was twenty nine. We got girls throwing their bras off, shaking their tits at us, throwing underwear at us. They were out to have a wild time, and we were rock stars, and we acted like rock stars. This wasn't, you know, kind of people don't look at the audience. We were. John Mellencamp engaged in the audience. He was very aggressive, but very sexual, too. He would get girls up and dance with them. And back then, he was good-looking and hyper. The whole audience was a wild night. Everybody was up on their feet. Girls were on guys' necks, and they were drinking bar beer. And it was they knew all the lyrics to our songs. We were on MTV. We were on Saturday Night Live. We were on you know, every TV show and everything. It was like we were happening, man. And I was a part of it, the beginning. What really, I mean, meaning where it really took off. So, man, we had, I mean, we had some fun. You can only imagine, and everybody on the stage and in the audience were equal participants. We all, it was just fun. It's just a great time. And then, hate to bring it, be a downer, but I'll never forget. I know exactly where I was sitting on the tour bus where we were on a private jet. And we're reading the Penthouse article or the whatever one of those uh, magazines are that talked about AIDS. And the way they talked about it, it was frightening. It sounded like we all got it. It's like it made it sound like you could kiss somebody or it's airborne. I mean, whatever they said, I don't remember the details. It was like, oh, my God, we're going to die. We're dead. It's too late. I was the first <laughs> one to get a blood test. So I go get my blood test. And I'm really, I'm nervous. I am actually nervous. You know, I had to wait two weeks. Talk about time. Oh, geez. You're waiting two weeks. That's, That's torture. Your, yeah. And the nurse, I call her, she says, well, Mr. Enough, you're negative. Now, when someone says something like negative, don't you think that means you're in trouble? Right. I got negative. <laughs> yeah. Fuck! I started screaming. I'm like, <laughs> oh my god! I'm almost crying. Like I got it. I got. It. I told you. Oh my god! I'm gonna call the guys up, and she's screaming through the phone. No, no, no. Kenny, Kenny, negative means you do not have it. Negative with the disease. Holy shit! So I went back to, to um, you know, we had next rehearsal. We had next day. I went back. I told the same story. I scared the hell out of him. Said. And what'd she say? She says, you're negative. They went, oh, shit. Well, I got, <laughs> now I'm, I'm calming them down. No, 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 no. We don't have it. Yeah. I don't. That's not a fun roller coaster to ride. 
Oh man, was, <laughs> God damn, yeah, yeah. So, uh, what I want to do now, Kenny, because we're we're at the end of the hour, I want to um, I'm going to edit this part out that I'm saying right now, but I'd I'd like to plug back in and say the formal goodbye that everyone will hear, and then if you're cool for another like minute or so, I'd I'd love to ask you um something follow up to the yeah. podcast. Yeah. <clears throat> well, Kenny, thanks so much, man. This has been a blast. Um, so much valuable information for our listeners, and I, I can't thank you enough for being on the show. Well, thanks for having me, man. I love uh, talking on these podcasts. It's great. Yeah, absolutely. And and like I said, so valuable. Where can our listeners find you to uh, kind of follow what you're doing and keep up with everything going on? I try to post on all these four places every day. Uh, my Twitter is Aronoff with a capital A official because someone stole my name. It, it's it's Aronoff and it's capital official O F. How do we spell official? <laughs> <laughs> too, too late for that. <laughs> so it's Aronoff official. My Instagram is Kenny Aronoff. My Facebook is Kenny Aronoff. But man, everybody keeps saying, add me, add me. Well, my Facebook filled up eight oh, yeah. years ago. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't I don't even have time yeah. to, to, to get to look at who I get rid of. You yeah. know? I don't have time. <laughs> I, so, I, d- I dumped I, Facebook a while back. <laughs> so, but Facebook fan page, and I also have uh, LinkedIn. And okay, cool. And if you go to my website, www.kennyaronoff, and then it links to the, the speaking page, which I have a lot of videos of me speaking, which is www.kennyaronoff forward slash speaking. But you can get to that page on my normal web- website. You just tap on uh, you know, my speaking thing. And I actually have a studio thing. I haven't updated the songs in so long, but it's uh, – Uncommon Studios with an S, LA. Uncommon Studios, LA dot com. Yeah, and, and you know, got there's all kinds of ways to contact me. If I don't answer, make your questions short. If the questions are long, I just don't have time. I get two hundred three emails a day. Yeah, I, I can't do it. I, I'm doing. I got to deal with a lot of stuff. So if you start asking a lot of questions, and I do have a web store. Some people say, can you send me a autograph picture? I, I just don't have time to do that. So I have a web store, and it gets done that way. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Kenny, and um, let's talk again soon. Dallas, thanks for having me. It, that was fun. Yeah, no problem. Love to have you back. All right. Okay, buddy. Yeah, anytime. See you, all right, Bye. Hey, guys. First of all, thank you so much for listening. If you could please take a quick moment to subscribe on iTunes and leave a rating and review, your feedback seriously is really important, and it helps us keep the show alive. Check out MusiciansTalkShow.com to sign up for our mailing list. If you do, we're going to send you our main theme song and a few other surprises. Plus, you'll always be the first to know what episodes are coming up. If you want to help support the show so we can keep putting out the highest quality content possible, please follow the Support the Show link at our website and consider donating to our Patreon page. Lastly, if you have an idea for a guest or a question you want to discuss, contact us through any of the contact forms on our website, and we'll do everything we can to make it happen. Whew, all right. That was a lot, but we got through it. Thanks again, guys, and we will see you soon. Thank you.